Now, I'm just going to compile this and run it. And before I do, why don't we just kind of make it do something of mild interest. You know, let's go handle an event for this guy. Well, to handle events, it'll be very similar to doing WPF2. So I'm going to handle a click event. And I'll just auto-generate a handler here. And then over here, I might say this dot my button. And I found that the, the uh, IDE doesn't like to show you the actual content, uh, the actual member variables until you recompile. Right? So if you're typing in the name of something, you go to your code file and you can't find it, it's probably still there. Something like that. Save it. Yeah, I just always recompile it. Yeah, saving will probably work too. So there's my little button. I click it, right? See how I just went ahead and displayed different content. If I right click right here, they'll look at what I'm actually working with. Right? A Silverlight plugin. Okay. But now for the fun part, let's see what actually happened back in the code. So let's do this. Let's go to show all files. And we're going to take a little look under the covers at what the compiler actually generated. Okay. Okay, first of all, if you were to go under the OBJ debug directory, which is just a standard directory of all Visual Studio projects, right? You're going to find these particular files that have a G infix. Right? I know you can't see it back there, but I got one guy right here called page.g.cs. And one guy over here called app.g.cs. Well, G stands for basically compiler generated. Okay? Remember we said how all this markup over here actually becomes a real object model? Well, part of what we're going to find in these G files would be things like member variables. So remember we had this button here called my BTN? If I were to open up this page and take a look at the code the compiler generated here in the background, there's my button. Okay. If I take a look inside of the always present initialized component, <laughs> right, pretty much all the designers have a call to initialize component, well then there's some interesting stuff going on in here. Let me just go to full screen mode here. What's basically happening in this set of code statements is that the binary version of the XAML has automatically been embedded into that Silverlight plugin. Right? <laughs> And we're going to use a resource right, based on a system.uri type. So the name of the resource is going to be the same exact name as the actual XAML file. But it's not actually reading the XAML file. That's just the name of the embedded resource. Okay? So if I were to actually go look in a tool like Reflector, for example, I could see that embedded little blob. I can see it a little bit over here in Visual Studio. If I go ahead and type on the g.resources, that's the guy that has that embedded XAML. And if I just kind of scan in here, you know, eventually we'll start to see things that look kind of familiar, like uh, height and width, name equal my button, content equal OK, the click event equals this. Right? So basically, all of this is the declaration of the button. Okay. So that original markup, which is really user-friendly and happy, right, back over here, doesn't really exist. <laughs> it's just there temporarily for the compiler. So it can generate the G files and the embedded BAML. Is that all clear? Where is the BAML at physically right now? Uh, it's just under the bin. Well, I mean, physically here, it's just an embedded resource. Right, but physically? It would be, inside the application. yeah, it would be in the Silverlight plugin. It's just part of that little blob. Yeah. Any other questions right now on kind of what's going on here on the Visual Studio side of life? Okay, let me just show you this now. You know, I didn't even, I wasn't even mindful of where I saved this project. Probably on my desktop, I think. Let's see. It is. Was it on my desktop? Yeah. Okay. So let me just compile it to make sure it actually works here. Okay, so here's my amazing program. <laughs> but uh, let's actually. Close down Visual Studio altogether. And let's open up Blend. So I'm going to open up that 2.5 preview edition.
Now again, notice from this particular tool, I could certainly start to make new projects as well. So if I went into new project here, I could make a brand new guy from scratch. But I want to open up the guy that I just made, which I was told is on my desktop somewhere. There we go. Right? So this is the same thing we just made in Visual Studio. All right, so now we're going to open up this project. Okay. So let's just do something to show that, yes, this is actually a different piece. You know, this is where, as we can kind of see, right, we're in a little bit of a different territory than we would be in Visual Studio, right? So if I were to kind of like rotate this button a little bit, right, maybe kind of skew it, <laughs> you know, just do something to, to make it different. You know, what this is doing here is it's just rendering out different markup in the background. It's just applying a transformation. Okay? Now, I could type all this myself in Visual Studio. Okay? What I can't do in Visual Studio is what I just showed you here. I couldn't grab that button and just start to do things where I was twisting and rotating and skewing this thing. Okay? But if I go ahead and save it all, now let's go back to where we came from. Let's go back to Visual Studio. If I take a look at my little page, we'll find my, my warped skewed button over on this side. Right? So not bad. Right? We've got two different tools that work collaboratively. And typically, two different people working collaboratively too. Okay? So now notice again how the button is still the button. Even though it looks very, very different, <laughs> really hard to read that, but it still says the same string. Right, the same content is being rendered just at a transformed, skewed angle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like you know, two people opening up the same project in Visual Studio, you know, because it is the same project, right? Uh, partial classes can help there though, a little bit, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could copy and paste it in Kazaml and see the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, not, not really. I mean, it has an SLN and a CS proj and a VB proj idea. You know, so you can still do some version control and source control, but, you know, TFS is really about the code stuff. This is more about the, the artiste stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's the same directory structure, same file structure, same project. Right, it is. Yeah, yep, it is. Take one more question if there is one that I want to show a real demo. If you're writing an application today for an enterprise that would most likely be on the desktop, at least to begin with, mm -hmm. could you just do it as a Silverlight app, yeah. or would you want to stick with like WPS? That's what I tried to do. <laughs> And that's where I found a couple of gotchas. I mean, yeah, you can, in many cases, you know, trans transfer a bunch of stuff, right? But it, remember, it's not verbatim, right? Limited subset. But you, know. you started with, with the Silverlight app and... Yeah, basically what I found is either you're going to trim it down or scale it up. <laughs> you know, if, 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 you, if you really know the differences in the, the code model, you can be pretty disciplined. Like, okay, I can't do that. Because then I'm going to be tied to this, you know. And then you could really just copy paste stuff, but that takes time, right. and I'm still learning too. Like when I figured out that whole name thing, I'm like, <laughs> you know, and I'd change a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs>